begin in our message. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Great God, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, and we invite you again into this place, and we invite you to speak to us through your word. It's your word, Lord, and so we invite you to let you do um, your work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Little Johnny stood in the church foyer one morning. He was looking up at a plaque on the wall. He was only seven years old, and so he couldn't quite read all of the words, but he noticed a lot of names on it. The pastor saw him standing there, and the pastor came up beside him and said, what are you looking at, son? I'm looking at this. What is this? The pastor somberly said, well, This is a list of those who died in the service. And they both shared a moment of silence together. Finally, Johnny broke the silence and he said, was it the 9 a.m. or or the 11 a.m. service? (laughs) Sometimes it might feel like you're going to die while at church, but hopefully that is not the case for any of us today. But our sermon is entitled the preacher or the pastor, or the sermon that killed the pastor. Uh, A sermon that was so powerful and potent that it ended up killing the person who spoke it. Uh, So the words that we're reading today are powerful and important. And I invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 6 and 7 today. Don't worry, we're not going to read every single verse Although it would be good if you could, on your own, go home and read through the whole section. Acts chapter 6. We start there in verse 1. Acts 6 and verse 1. The Bible there says, Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected, in the daily distribution. The church was growing so much, and any organization that grows has growing pains. And as you recall, they shared all things in common. There was a common fund with money to distribute to those who were poor. But there was a certain group of people, certain group of widows, that felt like they were being overlooked and neglected. And there was probably no conscious effort to overlook or neglect these widows. But it says that they were the Hellenist widows. So uh, among the Jews who had converted to Christianity, there were some who were living, native-born in Palestine and spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. And there were others, because of the history of the Jewish dispersion through the various captivities and so forth, that lived outside of Palestine and spoke probably Greek and shared a different culture. Uh, And so you've got two different groups of people, both with the same Jewish ancestry and both with the newly embraced Christian faith, but one group was feeling like they were being neglected. And so they brought their concerns to the disciples, or rather to the apostles. The the use of disciples here is now going to include everybody. The apostles here are now called the Twelve. We are all disciples, not just those who are part of the Twelve. So it goes to the Twelve, To the apostles, verse 2, And the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, they weren't saying, This work is below us. This work is unimportant. They're just saying, We have been given a a special and specific calling and mission by God, and that's to preach and teach. We need to find someone else that we can appoint to this work. Um, Now, when it says serving tables, you might think of someone bussing tables in a restaurant. Uh, That's not what's going on here. We're talking about the distribution of funds. And the Greek word for tables is the same word for tables when Jesus went in and overturned the tables in the temple that the money changers were using. So this is the tables that were used for receiving the gifts and dispersing the gifts. They said, we need to find someone else who can do this for us. Verse 3, therefore, brethren... Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of what? 
the Holy Spirit. Um, this, even though it was a job that it was involving money and, and, and so forth and not a preaching job, they needed people that were spirit-filled. Um, and whether you work, um, no matter what your job is, all of us should be spirit-filled Christians. Amen? Uh, and whatever position you may have or not have in the church, it should be one where you are spirit-filled. Um, every part of the body is important. So people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom of whom you may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer, whether that's personal and public, and to the ministry of the word. Verse 5 tells us that the, the saying pleased the multitude. And so they chose Stephen. Uh, he's mentioned first uh, because he's being introduced here, and we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about him in a moment. Stephen, tradition tells us, was actually, well, at least if the tradition is true, was a part of the 70 that Jesus sent out to announce that the Messiah was here. Uh, so he may have personally known Jesus from uh, previous contact. Stephen, it says here, was a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it goes on to list several others there. And in verse 6 it says, They set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Um, in Luke's writings, hands are laid on for multiple reasons. Hands are laid out on for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Hands are laid on for appointing to an office like this. Um, and this sort of commissioning, um, or, or hands were also laid on for healing in Luke's writing. Um, but it's interesting, when you look at the, the names that are listed there in verse 5, all of them are Greek names. None of them are originally Hebrew names. And which group of widows felt like they were the ones that were being overlooked? Was it the Greek ones or the, the, the um, Palestinian-born ones? It was the Greek ones, the Hellenists, as they were called. And so in a, in a very wise move, they selected people that would make sure that nobody felt overlooked, especially the group that was feeling overlooked. And then verse 7, it says, And the word of God did what? It spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the who? The priests were obedient to the faith. Not only are the non-priestly people accepting the good news, there are priests. Now, this is probably not the, the high priest type people. Uh, there were as many as perhaps 8,000 priests in those days, and they would serve at various times. Most of them were poor, but there were a number of them um, who started to hear and accept and receive Jesus as Savior. And then verse 8 gets back to Stephen. It says, He was full of faith and power, and he did wonders and signs among the people. Not only was he a good guy and able to help make good, wise, fair decisions for the widows and those in need, he was working miracles. But when good things are happening, we've seen it again and again, there are other people who don't like what's going on. And there arose, verse 9, some from what is called the synagogue of the freedman, the Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. They can't resist his arguments, so what do they do? They turn to trickery and coercive means. Verse 11, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred at the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon them and seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, being the temple, and against the law. Now, these are really kind of the same complaints. Moses and God. Moses was synonymous with the law. He's the one who received the law. And the temple, in their thinking, was almost synonymous with God. In fact, for many of the people, sadly, they had become to, 
to venerate and worship the temple more than they did the God that the temple was made for. So they're saying, this man is is defaming, is blaspheming, is denigrating, is speaking badly against Moses and against God. And then look at verse 14. They take it a step further. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, Stephen, all he was doing was sharing what Jesus had shared with him. He was preaching the good news that Jesus had given to him. And what we find is, ultimately, this complaint is really not against Stephen, but against Jesus. Uh, This is a sore issue for those who didn't accept Jesus the first time. Here's another guy preaching the same thing of that Jesus of Nazareth. And it's really Jesus that's put on trial here. Again, this issue has come up. In verse 15, it says, And all who sat on the council, looking steadily at, steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of what? An angel. Now, how would you picture an angel's face to be, or based on what, how the Bible describes angels? What, what are you picturing his face looked like? Yeah. Kind of like when Moses received the law and he came down from the mountain. People said, well, your face is so bright. Cover it up. Stephen was so full of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that his face before this council was glowing. That would make you, if you really saw this and you were against it, it would make you reconsider your position, wouldn't it? You would hope so. So then we get to chapter 7. The high priest said, are these things so? Are the accusations laid against you? You've been blaspheming Moses and God, the law and the temple, continuing the things of Jesus. And he starts off and is given an opportunity, a springboard into a sermon. And he said to them, brethren and fathers, Listen. He's, he greets them with terms of respect. Brethren, fathers, listen. The God of what? Glory. The God of glory. Now, are, the, are those the words of somebody who sounds like they're a blasphemer against God? No. He already starts... Um, by giving God glory. He starts refuting the charges against him, not as much by directly defending himself, but by the language that he's using. He's clearly uh, uplifting God and not blaspheming God. The God of glory appeared to our father who? Abraham, when he was where? In Mesopotamia. Um, Now, don't miss this point here. They're concerned that he is defiling and and defaming the temple, the temple, this holy, holy, holy place. And they're forgetting that God can and does dwell elsewhere too and shows up and appears elsewhere. You don't even need to be in the promised land for God to show up. He reminds them God showed up in Mesopotamia to Abraham. And he begins this story, unfolding a story. Uh, They're familiar with this story, and you're probably familiar with the story. So we won't read every single verse. But he continues talking and laying out a case. And essentially, one of the big things he's doing is he's, he's giving them evidence that he's not a blasphemer against God or Moses, uh, He's also reminding them that that God is not confined to a building. But even more than that, he's telling a story about a people who time and time again rejected the messengers that God sent them. God had a message to give to them, and they ignored it, and they rejected it. He's building the case 
that the same errors of their ancestors are the errors that they themselves are committing right now. And he is hoping and praying that the tides will be turned in their mind and that they will come to accept Jesus. So notice an example of this. Look at verse 9. After talking about Abraham for a while, he moves on to the patriarchs. Verse 9, it says, And the patriarchs becoming what? Jealous, or my Bible says envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. God raised up this guy named Joseph. He had dreams. He had visions of the future. But his brothers didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to receive it. They stopped up their ears, as it were, and they sold him, ultimately, into Egypt. He continues in verse 23. Now we're talking about Moses. We've gotten to the time of Moses. Now when he was how many years old? Forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Now we're not defending Moses' temper and his act of murder here, um, but you remember the story, and, and Stephen goes on to tell it, how the people rejected him. They're like, oh, are you going you gonna to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Here God is trying to raise up Moses to deliver the people from Israel, from from people of Israel from Egypt, and many of them were already rejecting him from the beginning. Verse 27, But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed them away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Here we have a leader raised up by God, and people are already saying, You're not the boss of me. Did you ever say that when you were a kid? Well, if you had older siblings, you probably found yourself saying, or younger siblings, too. You're not the boss of me. So we go through the history. We continue going on. Uh, look at verse 35. It says there in verse 35, This Moses, whom they what? Mm-hmm. Whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him by the bush? They rejected him. Who made you a ruler over us? He's laying a pattern of rejecting the messengers of God. And it's interesting there, uh, he uses the word deliverer, which in Greek is only used this particular word one time in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, translated into, into Greek, called the Septuagint, or the LXX, um, it's used multiple times when translating the Hebrew word goel. Goel is the kinsman redeemer. You know the story of Ruth? Ruth was in distress. She needed help, along with Naomi. And so the next of kin was the one who came to rescue them and come to their aid. Uh, and, and the Goel, the, the kinsman redeemer, has strong messianic connections. Because who's the one that comes down to rescue us? In our distress, Jesus becomes like us, as us, becomes one of us in order that he might redeem us. And so Stephen uses this specific word in reference to Moses uh, and in verse 37 he makes a reference to a prophecy that Moses made about Jesus. Verse 37, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a what? A prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Moses spoke these words, and Peter and Stephen uh, and the disciples came to recognize that prophet as a prophecy about Jesus that Moses spoke about. Verse 38, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel, this Moses, who spoke 
to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. So we see time and time again, here's someone clearly sent by God, and the people, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I want to go back to Egypt. Stephen is sharing these things, hoping that something is going to land in the hearts of the people who are doing the same thing. We get to verse 48. He says, however, the the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Remember, one of the complaints against him was that he was blaspheming the temple. And they had become so fixed on this structure that they'd forgotten about the God of the structure. The God who'd been leading their ancestors. And he reminds them, you can't contain God in a building. Will the God of the universe be contained in a small box that we've made? Now at this point in verse 51, you'll notice he kind of shifts and he starts rebuking the people directly. Now we haven't read all the verses here, um, and it would seem like this maybe wasn't the ending to the sermon that he planned on making. But apparently Stephen, as he's speaking, he's seeing the people get more and more riled up, more and more angry, more agitated. And he realizes this whole thing is about to blow apart. And he goes in for his final comments here. He says to them, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. Now these were two adjectives that were used to describe the people in Old Testament language. Stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. Stiff-necked means they are stubborn. Uncircumcised of heart means that they are Gentiles. They are, their heart is not consecrated to God. And then he says this, You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. The pattern I've laid out for you from this survey of, of, of history, you're doing the exact same thing. And of course, in these words, there's an opportunity for them to turn. The rebukes that God gave in the Old Testament and in the New Testament are, are, are opportunities for us to turn from our ways. Verse 52, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers. Your fathers killed the prophets who prophesied the Messiah, and you killed the Messiah, who have received the law by the direction of angels and not kept it. They're accusing him of blaspheming God and Moses, and he turns the tables, and he says, no, the history has shown us What's going on? It's you. You can imagine that this did not go over well. When they heard these things, 54, it says they were cut to the heart. Apparently there was some type of of conviction that, that struck them. But if you've ever had a conviction and ignored it, you, you maybe know what they went through. It says, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. Here, in his moment where he knows he's about to die, he looks up, and there's Jesus. What a, what a merciful thing for Jesus to do for him. Now, this didn't happen to every single martyr, but you can read the stories about martyrs who, who were being burned at the stake, singing praises to God. 
at total peace in their hearts and on their expressions. And Stephen had this special gift. And as he's saying the things, what's the response of the people? Covering their ears. A very fitting description of the stiff-necked accusation they had just heard. They ran at him with one accord. It's possible to be in one accord, um, but for the wrong thing. And they cast him out of the city. That's where the law said he had to be stoned, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named who? Saul. Remember how we said Luke likes to briefly introduce people he's going to talk about later? There was a young man there. And by the way, the the phrase young man, praise the Lord, from their time could be between 20 and 40. So when people say to me, young man, I say, thank you. (laughs) But we could expand it even further if you want. Um, So Saul is there. Uh, And to do a good stoning, you take off your jacket so you can really get into it. And there he is, witnessing all these things. uh, Thinking that they're doing what needed to be done. Saying to himself, probably in his heart, good riddance, let's get this blasphemer out of here. One less person who is... Uh, betraying the sacred trust of the truths that we've been handed uh, and, and to hold on to. Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen, and as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, receive my breath. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. As we know, the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, uh, death is called asleep. You know, his death has some interesting parallels to the death of Jesus. Some of the words are, are sort of similar, even extending the forgiveness to those who are murdering him in his greatest time of need. There's a lot to think about with this story. There's a lot to reflect on, Uh, but before we wrap things up, I want to just go back to one verse here. When Stephen saw Jesus, what posture was Jesus in? He was standing. Usually, when it describes Jesus and the throne, he's sitting on the throne. Uh, But this time, he was standing, and uh, actually, instead of saying Jesus, it calls him something different. What's he called there? Son of Man, this is actually Jesus' favorite title for himself, but he didn't make it up. It comes specifically from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. There's a heavenly judgment scene. Thrones are set in place, and one like the Son of Man, in all the glory, comes before the Ancient of Days. It's a time when, uh, in the prophecy, there's this little horn power that's, that's persecuting the saints, and, and horrible things are happening, but then there's the scene in heaven where the Son of Man goes into a work of judgment to make things right for those who are being oppressed, for those who are being abused for the sake of the gospel. And so probably the significance of Jesus standing is that Jesus is engaged in a work of judgment. Uh, And judgment is always good for those who have accepted the judge. You'll recall, actually, in Daniel chapter 12, when it talks about just after Daniel 11 closes and and there's all of the the horrible things, the work of uh, the king of the south, king of the north, and everything that goes on there, and there's a time of trouble, and it says in Daniel 12 verse 1, at that time, Michael stands up. Enough is enough. It's time for the final work of judgment. It's time for the final things to happen before I return. Or recall the story when Jesus was at the temple one day, and he's sitting there, 
And they bring a woman caught in the middle of adultery, caught in the very act, didn't bring the guy for some reason, only the woman uh, shows some bias. Caught in the act, and they, they want to stone this woman right there. Or maybe not right there, but they want to stone her that day. And Jesus starts doing something, and he's writing in the sand. And, and from the writings of Ellen White and, and from just reasoning, uh, it seems reasonable to conclude, based on the, the response of the elders, that he's writing their sins. Uh, because he stands up and he says, whoever has no sin, cast the first stone. And all of them, convicted by what's written in the sand, apparently, walk away. Jesus, in that act of standing up, he is standing as judge. And then he says, woman, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. When Jesus stands up and Stephen looks up into the heavens, he sees Jesus standing there. Jesus is standing because he can't stand what's going on to his beloved, and he is standing as judge. For all the wrongs that are committed in this world, there is a judge who one day will make it all right. And if we have that judge as our judge, we have nothing to fear. So as we close, I want to ask you a question. You've heard this story. We've summarized parts of it. But who do you identify with most in the story? Do you identify with Stephen? Uh, perhaps you've been accused of things um, unjustly blamed for things, slandered. Or maybe you've been trying to share your faith with someone and it's falling on deaf ears. You're trying to be a witness and people are just rejecting you. Maybe this morning you feel a little bit like Stephen. Or today, do you feel at all like the religious leaders? We probably say, oh no, I don't feel like them. But... Have you ever heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and you said, nope. La, 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 God, I'm not listening. I think sometimes it's literally hard for us not to have music or, or TV or, or something going on because those things sometimes distract us from the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Sometimes we're not comfortable being left alone with our thoughts and being left alone with God's voice speaking to us. Do you, do you, is it possible that you might, in, it, in some small way, identify with these religious leaders where God's been trying to get a message through to you and maybe you've been ignoring it? Or maybe there's a pattern in your family history uh, of certain behaviors that have gone before and maybe you're falling into the same pattern like they were, they were from their religious history. Or maybe this morning you say, Pastor, I'm a mix of all of it. The good news this morning is Jesus is alive. The Jesus that Stephen saw standing there by the throne, wanting to offer him comfort and help and hope and justice and eternal life is the same Jesus that wants to offer us the strength that we need. Whether it's strength to endure a trial that you're going through, strength to continue witnessing even when you're discouraged, or strength to, to do what you know you ought to do. Strength to, to follow the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. For whatever it is, this morning there is hope, there is help. Jesus is offering it today. Who here wants to, by the raising of your hand, just say, yes, Jesus, I want to receive your help with this issue in my life today. I want your help, Jesus. Well, this morning, after we pray here, there's going to be a special prayer group in our committee room. If you want extra prayer on a certain issue, um, join our prayer team up front. Spend a little extra time this morning in prayer about this. Let's bow our heads as we close.
Dear God, we are so grateful that you love us even when we make mistakes. You pursue us even when we ignore the voice of your Holy Spirit, even when we struggle to surrender. Jesus, we are so grateful that you died for us, you rose again, and you ever live to make intercession for us. Father, we can't wait to see you someday soon. Please come back soon, Lord Jesus. Give us the, the Holy Spirit to strengthen and empower us and use us this week to make a difference in someone else's life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. God bless you.